So we will be talking about learning, we will be talking about AI, and I would also ask Dr. Ovid to start with uh, introducing herself and talking just a little bit about the Paradox Lab that she is writing for teenagers, okay? So, Iris, please start. Thank you, Julia, and thank you all. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I, uh, I got some of the questions that you asked uh, last week uh, when Julia spoke with uh, a few of you and they were really interesting deep questions so I can see that you are already thinking about these questions uh, and uh, it sounds like you're really in a position to help solve some of these problems so uh, really my hope in um, in, in talking to you today and also with, with my own um, educational center, the Paradox Lab is to really uh, inspire kids to think about um, some of these big philosophical puzzles that we're just now starting to be able to address with science. And uh, and also to kind of get us get a, a sense from you if uh, you know uh, usually young people have uh, more creative solutions to problems than uh, grown up people do. So I I actually think that uh, some of you may really be in a position to answer some of these questions or help help give us some new directions for exploring them. And hopefully you'll join us in in the future as you as you get more educated and and go into these fields. Uh, so the Paradox Lab is really, um, it's, uh, it's mostly philosophical inquiry, but for me, philosophical inquiry is always tied up with the sciences. So uh, we ask questions about the mind, we ask questions about knowledge, we also ask questions about morality, um, but uh, the sciences uh, get tangled up in there uh, all the time. So. Uh, if you're interested in the Paradox Lab, you can find it at www.paradoxlab.org. Uh, hopefully I will see some of you there. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start my presentation if everyone is ready. I will share my screen and I'm going to do it like this so I can see all of you. Uh, I would like to um, get through the slides pretty quickly so that we can have a real discussion at the end. Uh, but if, um, if you have any thoughts, I will be asking you questions along the way. So please share in the chat any questions you have or any ideas you wanna share. Um, yeah, any, um, you know, if, if you have a really, really pressing question that I that I need to stop for, uh, then maybe indicate that with a wave and, uh, and we can pause and, and, uh, and address your question. But let's, let's try to hold off until the end, so we can uh, really have space for it. Okay. So, how to raise an AI baby? Well, Let's start actually with why to raise an AI baby. And that's actually mostly what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how, but let's focus mostly on the why. Okay, so why do this? Why would you wanna raise an AI baby? So go ahead and write in the chat what you think. Why might it be a good idea to build an AI baby and then to raise it? Why, why could that be a worthwhile thing to do as human beings. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pause here so that I can see some of your answers before we, before we go on. Yeah, okay, so to practice taking care of a baby. I think that's actually why most uh, in the past, especially why people would build robot babies, right? To train potential parents, right, uh, to teach especially teenagers so that uh, they know what they'd be getting into if they, uh, if they got pregnant and had a baby and, and chose to take care of it. Um, watch how the human mind develops. Uh, it's, it is kind of scary, yes, the whole idea of raising an AI baby is scary and creepy, right, for maybe for people who can't have babies, that's a really interesting idea, yeah. You know, maybe especially um, the elderly who are a bit lonely, maybe they, uh, they would enjoy having a robot baby to, to, to teach. All right. Oh, to see what happens. Use it as an experiment. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so 
Um, here are some of the, the uh, this is really the main motivation that um, uh, uh, people have for building an AI in general. Okay, so let's think about just AI. Why do people build AI, right? And usually the whole uh, motivation for that in the past especially has been to build machines that do intelligent things, right? Engineers are really interested in this, right? So let's just consider this project first. Why build an AI? Um, for me, it really is to understand human beings. I think it's great. You maybe occasionally, maybe you'll have some machines that do some intelligent things. Maybe they'll be more intelligent because they're more human-like in the way that they think. But for me, really, this is a method of, uh, of trying to understand human minds. So let's, let's go down this path a little bit. Um, oh, actually, let me back up. Uh, so maybe, you know, in, in the context of space exploration, right, maybe if we really build an AI that learns the way that a human learns, then maybe it could go on to learn new languages the way that humans do so well. And maybe they could even learn new categories of stuff, right, in other planets, right, or other, other space uh, bodies and um, uh, territories. Uh, and maybe they could also, just like children, very young children are really good at asking questions. So maybe if we build an AI that thinks and learns the way a human does, maybe it would also come up with questions that humans wouldn't have thought to, to ask. And then also babies and, and young minds are really good at coming up with new hypotheses and new explanations for things. So, um, uh, and then also they're really good at coming up with new experiments. So building an AI that thinks like a young human um, could potentially allow us to solve some new problems. Okay, so how did I get interested in this? Well, I grew up in a tiny town in northern Arizona called Prescott, and it was a very homogenous, very uh, white Christian town, and my family was from Israel and France, and uh, we had a Jewish, culturally Jewish background, and I really didn't fit in. I was different, and frankly, the kids didn't really like me. Uh, and I didn't know why. I wanted to know why. I really wanted to connect with people and I was struggling. So this made me really curious about people. And so from a very young age, I started asking, why do people believe what they believe? Um, so this was really my motivation for exploring artificial intelligence. Why do people believe what they believe? Maybe you can go ahead and uh, put into the chat some thoughts. Why do you think people believe what they believe? Or do you have ideas for how we might discover this, right? We, we have some sciences that try to explore this. We also kind of try to introspect, especially uh, uh, in the past when thinking about this, before we had really good tools in the sciences of, in the neurosciences and, and uh, psychology to, to explore these questions. Um, Philosophers would kind of just reflect on their own beliefs and their own processing. So maybe can you, can you think about how, how might we figure out why people believe what they believe? So uh, in my little town, it was very conservative. People didn't really ask these kinds of questions and they thought it was weird to ask these questions. But my parents were scientists, so I was lucky and um, they encouraged my curiosity. Uh, yeah, is there a question? Did someone want to um, jump in? Go ahead. There were a couple of answers in chat. Oh, great. Oh, here, let me see what people are saying. Here, let me open the chat. Thanks. Okay. Oh, okay. So maybe one reason to build a human, uh, a robot baby or an AI baby is to make it easier to communicate with, right? If it thinks the way that we do, then maybe it'll be easier for us to communicate with. And I think that's actually really on point. I think that's one of the things that a lot of AI has missed. Um, the more similar um, something is to ourselves, 
the more we'll be able to understand each other, right? So maybe for communication, and, and we need to be able to communicate if we want to use these things to help us solve problems, right? And, and to work together and live in the world together. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Quinn, Quinn suggests maybe just ask the baby AI to solve our problems. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe not quite when it's a baby, but as it starts to develop and, uh, and hopefully learn some things and understand the world a bit, maybe it would be able to solve our problems. Um, oh, oh, they want to think for themselves. Yeah. So this is a really interesting, um, uh, idea you know when when we think about machines we think of them as you know being really like deterministic and if this and then that and even even the more sophisticated kind of uh associationist machines they're really just doing this mechanical kind of operation so it doesn't seem like these things are thinking for themselves right so maybe uh maybe if we I think, De AI Declan's, I think yeah. Declan's point was that in why uh, he was trying to answer your question about why do uh, people have beliefs and he's saying uh -huh. maybe they want to think well of themselves oh oh sorry oh i'm so sorry i misread that yes oh thank you for clarifying yes yeah, so why do people believe what they believe oh they they want to think well of themselves yes so we actually have a lot of cognitive biases and maybe that's what you're thinking of um sometimes we believe things that we really don't have good reason to believe, but maybe they make us feel good, right? So sort of like a wishful thinking, or it's sometimes called confirmation bias, right? Or, or outcome bias that, um, so we have these biases in our, in our belief formation, right? And a lot of the time we're pretty good at forming beliefs that are accurate or at least uh, generally useful. We might say rational in some ways, but sometimes we do make mistakes, right? So those are part of the story of how we come to believe what we believe. Okay. A lot of- And, uh, and so two other people uh, answer, trying to answer your question about beliefs say uh -huh. that people are exposed to specific views through their parents or guardians or yes. peers Great. and develop similar beliefs. And yeah. also lots of times people do not question things because they have been told a certain way for so long that they think questioning is wrong or not worth it. Right, right. Yeah, so if everyone around you is believing a certain way, and certainly in this town that I grew up in, everybody um, was pretty much going to the same church. They, their parents were all friends. They all had kind of similar, their parents had all similar backgrounds and education. So um, they just passed on the same beliefs. And so everyone around them just behaved as if those beliefs were true. And maybe there was no reason to question them. But for me, you know, noticing this mismatch between um, what was kind of talked about and assumed in my own house with my scientist parents who were foreign and Mediterranean and, uh, you know, did things very differently from the people in this little conservative town in Northern Arizona. Um, you know, I, I kind of noticed that mismatch and, and then that forced me to, to ask questions, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so I'm going to move on, but let's keep, uh, go ahead and keep uh, putting things in the chat as they come up. Um, so I wasn't great in school. I wasn't actually interested in school, um, but I discovered uh, cognitive science pretty early, um, right when I uh, was about to start university. Um, I just went to the state, you know, the state school, and it happened to have a really good uh, one of the top departments in cognitive science, and. Uh, some of the really the leaders in the field. And so cognitive science I discovered was this really rigorous way of asking questions that I was curious about all my life and didn't even know how to explore. I didn't even know that there was a place for someone like me in the world to, to be asking these questions. So cognitive science co combines all these fields, psychology, philosophy, neuroscience, linguistics, education, economics, all of these fields come together to try to understand various aspects about how the mind works. And one of the things that I thought was cool is it helped me think about the relationship between the mind and the brain. So let's see what you think about this question. Is the mind the same thing as the brain? Are the mind and brain identical? Let's hear what, what you have to say.
Some say, no, they're not identical. Uh, well, to answer that, you need to find out where consciousness comes from. Okay, consciousness, this is the hardest problem, right? The hard problem of, of the philosophy of mind. What is consciousness? The mind is your body working together, whereas the brain is a body part. Interesting. Okay, no, they're not the same thing. Okay, what about, um, what about this? Is the mind some kind of spiritual, non-physical stuff? So go ahead and ask, answer that second question and I'll read the, the comments here. I think that the brain is the physical thing, but the consciousness, emotions, and our thoughts and beliefs, et cetera, are our mind. Okay, so maybe there are some aspects of what we do with our brains and what we call, you know, mental activity. Um, there's, th those are physical, maybe perception and, you know, motor commands, maybe deciding to eat and things like that. But consciousness, emotions, maybe those are something, something else. Okay, is the mind some kind of spiritual, non-physical stuff? All right, well, I'll go on to say that what cognitive science suggests uh, is this idea that the mind is kind of like a computer. So if we think of a computer as having hardware, this physical stuff, right, it's hard, <laughs> and it's got wires and it's got, um, you know, it's got a, a, a hard drive, it's got all of these physical processors, right, these connections, uh, all these wires, right? Uh, so the, the brain is kind of like that, you might say, right? The brain has its own wires, but they're made out of, you know, instead of silicon and, and various metals, it's, it's made out of meat, right? Meat brain stuff. Um, and then there's the software, right? The program, the code. And, and that's not exactly physical in the same way that your computer is, right? It's some kind of physical process. It's something that happens on that hardware. So the computational theory of mind is the view that the mind is the physical software that runs on the brain hardware. Or some people will say the brain, so the, the brain has wetware, right? Whereas your computers have hardware, it's wet and squishy, right? But it's just basically a neat computer. Okay, so I really liked this idea because it gave me a framework for thinking about these questions. Why do people believe what they believe? And actually this theory about the mind has uh, been really fruitful for investigating how people form their beliefs and, and um, do various other aspects of cognition. Uh, so at the University of Arizona, in my second year there, I met this philosopher, John Pollock, and he was an epistemologist. Uh, uh, he studied theories of knowledge, and especially he was interested in rationality. And his whole method, which I thought was just out there and a breakthrough was to try to understand rationality by building a machine that's rational. So he, he encoded his theory of rationality in an AI, he called it Oscar. And it was really a framework for, for thinking about how beliefs can interact with one another and how we come to have the beliefs that we have and also how we ought to have the belief, how we ought to reason, how we ought to form beliefs and where the mistakes are and why those are mistakes. So he, he put his theory basically into Oscar. Um, so then, you know, I worked with John Pollock a lot and then I went on to do a doctorate in philosophy studying the same questions because I wanted to understand what it is about mental stuff, the stuff that's in here that allows it to be about stuff that's out there. What is that relationship? Um, that aboutness relationship, that reference relationship. How is it that we can have these internal things that connect with the world? Um, that then led me um, to do a postdoc in machine learning and then another postdoc in developmental psychology. So I've been really kind of around the block thinking about these questions from, from the perspectives of various fields and trying to bring them together. Um, and I'm only now really recently starting to come up with some some ideas uh, that are connecting things. 
So here's here's one way to think about why people believe what they believe, right? So we've seen kind of this this tension, right, between uh, nature and nurture as explanations for why people believe what they believe. So, right, with nature, we think, okay, that's sort of what's what's um, what we're born with, what's maybe um, uh, given to us through our genetics, right? It's just what we inherit as part of being a human being. When we are born, we've got a certain brain, we're set up in some way. And then nurture is the environment that we then interact with and uh, use what we've got from birth to process what's happening in there. Okay, so any thoughts on this? Okay, it looks like people are really interested in consciousness, which is a really fantastic thing, I think, for kids to be working on, because that is really uh, puzzling a lot of people. Nobody's really come up with a satisfying answer, I think. Um, oh, what about being left-handed or right-handed? Yeah, so what about that, right? So there's all kinds of things that we can ask, right, about nature versus nurture. This image was actually taken from a website about obesity, okay? So people are exploring, okay, well, what leads to obesity? Is there some kind of genetic component or is it something about the environment that you have and what you eat and maybe the attitudes around you, maybe the social pressures and things like that? So we can ask this about all kinds of things. So what about being right-handed or left-handed? I think that most uh people who who work on on that topic um they seem to think that that is innate that that's something about the structure of your brain uh when you're born but i haven't really thought about that in a long time so i don't know i'm not up to date on that particular question okay so when it comes to belief maybe the nature aspect is more minor okay yeah so so really this is this is about you know how much of it is nature? How much of it is nurture? We, we can probably agree that there's a little bit of both uh, at the very least, and then maybe one side is heavier than the other. Okay, so keep writing what you think and I'll go on to say what some others have thought. Uh, so um, let's look at the nature side, okay? So let's look at what people have said is innate. So, so the idea that what we believe uh is um mostly determined or maybe even entirely determined by nature and what's built in or innate um, this idea is usually associated with the ancient greek philosopher plato uh, there are more modern versions plato is really talking about knowledge and he thought that um everything that we know is uh is so abstract and outside of this world it's not even about this world it's things like math and geometry and um we don't um we we're born knowing those and then and then we come to discover them uh, even morality and other kinds of um uh what you might think of as life lessons he thought were uh actually built in and then they kind of maybe surface into consciousness uh as we age uh so the earliest forms of AI used to take this kind of approach very seriously, or at least this is what they were stuck with. Um, this is also uh, sometimes called symbolic AI. Um, so the approach with symbolic AI uh, traditionally has been that you build an AI with a, a series of um, kind of sentential rules, sentence-like rules, okay? So if you're building uh, an AI that works in this block world, you might uh, store things, you might have, uh, your code might look like this, that if X is a block and Y is a pyramid, if you put Y on X, then Y will be on X. But if you put X on Y, then X will not be on Y. Okay, so very simple, right? But this kind of this is what the code would look like for such an AI. Okay, and then some of the early AIs um, worked in this way. Shrewdlu is uh, uh, was was an attempt by Terry Winograd to do a kind of blocks world agent where everything was really hard coded and all those physical relations um, were in place so that when uh, it was interacting with the world, it would use those if thens to figure out what would happen and make decisions. Chess. 
right? People thought, oh, this is intelligence, right? Being able to play chess. That's how you know if someone's smart. So let's build a machine that can play chess, then we'll have solved AI. Okay, it turns out chess, you know, if you build it in this way, at least, it's really not very interesting. You just consider every possible move and every possible consequence of that move and figure out, you know, what's the best move given the, the state of the board. Um, Eliza is a really early chat bot. And again, this is just taking, you know, looking for keywords in what you get as input and then spitting out something that kind of sounds somewhat maybe plausibly intelligent. Eliza was a therapist and it was the kind of therapist that, you know, mostly listens and just kind of reflects back to you what you say. So maybe this is an easy kind of um, uh, program to write if you want to fool people uh, into thinking that uh, that you have, uh, you've solved the problem of AI, that this, this bot understands, understands you, understands language. Um, of course, most people didn't really get fooled. Uh, most people could tell that this was a robot. They still in, enjoyed engaging with it, surprisingly. Um, they still found it uh, kind of therapeutic to kind of have their, their thoughts reflected back. Uh, okay, so symbolic AI, really good at abstract and causal reasoning, really good at the kind of if then uh, thinking. It, it's uh, really good at thinking about relationships between say being a cat and being a mammal and having four legs. Uh, those kinds of very explicit sentential sentence like um, uh, uh, beliefs, right? What we think of traditionally as beliefs. Okay, but but what? So what is, what's wrong with this? What's missing from this kind of AI? Let's go ahead and see what some of you think. Not very creative. I'll have to go back and read some of these chats later, but uh, yeah, so what else is missing from this kind of symbolic AI? And maybe some of you know what the alternatives are, the more popular approaches that are really kind of taking over the field today. Oh, they can't adapt to a situation well enough. Yeah, they're, they're really kind of like, um, you know, there are animals that have almost everything that they believe really built in, right? They have it innately. So like chickens and rats and insects, you know, they're just kind of these reflex machines. They don't... Um, they don't really learn very much, so they can't really adapt to their environments the way that humans can. Yeah, it needs to be more flexible. Interesting. Okay, so one problem with this is it doesn't seem plausible that all of our beliefs are innate, <laughs> right? What we understand about the world, you know, to have that all hard coded and, and innate, uh, that's really implausible, right? We, we kind of notice that when we're interacting with the world, we acquire new knowledge and what we believe is somewhat a reflection of our experiences. And not only that, but when you're building AI, you know, it's really hard to try to think about all the things that you believe and all of those relationships that, um, that we represent when we're interpreting the world and understanding the world. And that is, you know, um, people have tried to hard code that. And there are people who have spent, uh, you know, a decade or two with, you know, a, a large group of people trying to trying to write these belief networks, belief, belief webs. Um, and uh, they don't seem to be doing very well. They don't fill in the gaps uh, uh, of what we understand about the world very well. Okay, so let's go back to our nature versus nurture and consider the nurture side for a bit. Okay. The nurture side, oh, sorry. Uh, this is usually associated with Aristotle. Aristotle was another ancient Greek philosopher. He was the student of Plato and he kind of had the opposite view. He thought, no, 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 you're getting it wrong, Plato teacher. Uh, we, uh, I'm going to challenge your, your whole framework. Uh, I think learning is really important in how we form beliefs. Uh, and John Locke um, in the 17th century also uh, defended this view and is really um, kind of also famously associated with this idea that um, this really extreme kind of nurture position where um, we're born with almost nothing. Uh, he called it a blank slate or tabula rasa. 
Uh, and really everything that we believe is a result of our environment. And the neural networks approach in AI really kind of took this idea seriously and thought, great, we don't have to hard code anything. We can just build these association networks. Uh, it looks like neurons kind of do that. Neurons are just these little cells and they connect with each other in these uh, networks of neurons, right? These natural brain neurons um, uh, form networks. So let's try to model something like that. Maybe this will be much more like human brains or uh, other, other biological brains. And, um, and we can just have everything uh, be learned through experience by just um, taking those associations and using them uh, to do classification, recognition, um, uh, finding patterns. Okay, so a neural network might, for example, have a lot of images of animals, right? Now here, this is, this is a, just a really a small sample. It would, it, you know, an actual neural network in order to perform well, it would need thousands of examples of really each of these animals. Um, but after training, then when you give it an image of say this cat, it will take, a, take it apart pixel by pixel and find associations between those, that arrangement of pixels and what arrangements it's had before and use that to categorize this input, this cat as a cat. Okay, and now these things actually can do pretty well when they get a lot of data um, and get a lot of training. So um, they are really good at doing this kind of recognition, classification, prediction, pattern completion. Uh, it's usually used on images because they need so many uh, training samples that uh, you know, the internet ends up being really helpful for getting uh, training examples, especially if they are labeled. So if you can find images that are labeled and use that to train your machine, then it's gonna be in a, in a pretty good position to classify a new image uh, as belonging to one of those categories. As long as, you know, as long as the cats are in kind of the same, you know, orientation <laughs> as the training samples. So you have to be really careful with your training samples and make sure you're kind of accounting for maybe all of the angles that you might uh, see an agent. Um, it's also used for sound. So when you uh, talk to Siri or Alexa, right, there's some, there's a neural network there that's classifying the sounds that you're making and interpreting them as words, mapping those onto words. Um, again, it's using a lot of trained, a, a lot of training, a lot of examples, um, often kind of labeled. Um, and then uh, another, another place where these are used is for classifying text. So uh, finding a whole bunch of articles that are on a given topic uh, just by looking at associations between the words in those texts and finding similarities in those associations. So maybe there's a text that um, that talks about cats and it also talks about mammals and uh, uh, other texts also do that and it has found. So it's going to classify your new text as kind of being about the same thing. Okay, so this is um, a, a type of neural networks called supervised learning. Um, there's also unsupervised learning, which is also interesting. Um, mostly this is used for clustering and just finding, finding categories. So instead of having to label all of your examples, uh, you can get all kinds of um, text or images and, um, and this requires really a lot, a lot, a lot of, of training examples, but with enough training, it can find sort of similarities and differences and, and form clusters and then take those to be the types. So it's sort of like labeling itself. Uh, it's using, it's doing the labeling itself so that um, you don't have to have humans go in there and actually label every, every training example. Okay, so GPT-3, uh, language processors like GPT-3, Watson, chatbots um, uh, do this kind of thing. And so GPT-3 is seen, this is one of the kind of new exciting uh, AI, uh, you know, uh, we could call it a chatbot. It doesn't really do very well with chat, but it does do some language processing that looks really impressive. Uh, so here are just some observations about GPT-3. 
it outputs really cool things like it can it can give you you can ask for a summary of a movie right and it will go into all of the text that it has and provide to you a nice little summary of of whatever movie that you're asking about um, it can create imaginary dialogues between historical figures it can give medical advice now i don't know if it gives good medical advice but it gives medical advice <laughs> and it can actually uh write its own code it can write code right from lots and lots of examples of code that does various things it figures out what code does what and then you can ask it to write a program that does something and it, it's it's impressive it looks it looks pretty good especially as like a kind of first shot if you're trying to write a new program feed you know feed your question your problem into gpt3 it'll give you like a rough draft um what is the input? Okay, well, GPT-3 does these impressive things, but the input, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's got almost all of the internet. <laughs> it's got half a million books. <laughs> it's got, you know, all these news stories, all of Wikipedia, all the social media posts, really pretty much the whole internet. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of input, a lot of data um, that it's using. And the training, there's a lot of computing power okay but it uses lots and lots of computers to do the training okay but the the training is equivalent to uh, estimations are at a, a, that it's about equivalent to a trillion calculations every second for ten thousand years okay so if you can imagine i mean it's hard to imagine these big numbers but this is a lot of computing power okay so we can't all go out and build our own gpt3 but some people have worked together, used a lot of resources and created this thing, and now it can do some pretty cool stuff. Okay, basically all it's doing though is finding associations between words, right? When it finds a word, it looks like, it looks at what other words appear near it a lot of the time, and then it uses that to kind of uh, fill in, you know, what would be a reasonable thing to, to output given this input, given these, these, the words in these questions. Okay, this is a really, um, it's impressive. It's a really impressive uh, uh, um, kind of trick, right? Because we all, we all know that it's a trick and you can, you can convince yourself that it's a trick <laughs> by asking it really stupid questions. So the computer scientist, Kevin Lacker, um, uh, asked it some of these questions that, you know, no human child would make these mistakes, right? But GPT-3, as brilliant as it, as it might appear, um, uh, here's how it answers these questions. So how many eyes does my foot have? The answer, your foot has two eyes. <laughs> Question, how many eyes does the sun have? Answer, the sun has one eye. Okay. Question, how do you sporgle a morgel? You sporgle a morgel by using a sporgle. Hmm, seems sensible. <laughs> uh, how many bonks are in a quoit? There are three bon bonks in a quoit. How many rainbows does it take to jump from Hawaii to 17? Complete nonsense, right? It takes two rainbows to jump from Hawaii to 17. So it's just finding associations and giving its best guess. It's not even an educated guess. It's, it's just what it got, what it can do with the uh, associations it has observed in the past. Okay, so I know that there are some chats in here, but I'm going to whip by them because we only have 20 minutes left and I want to make sure we get to um, really have a conversation. So I'm going to just say a little bit more here. So neural networks, they're good at recognition, classification, prediction, pattern completion, but so go ahead and put in the chat what you think they are not very good at. And I will give you some of the things. Okay, so one, one problem is it doesn't seem plausible that all of our knowledge is learned. It seems like we've got some things to start with. Um, neural networks are really bad at abstract reasoning or causal reasoning. They just form shallow associations. They don't really have a model of the world in the sense that they could be said to um, represent it abstractly. 
it's really just looking at perceptible, you know, features, really shallow features. Oops. Uh, they need thousands of examples, hundreds of thousands of examples, or much more, right? Trillions of examples in the case of, of GPT-3, or maybe more, um, for, for just doing a simple task, a very specific narrow task, right? And they're easy to break. Okay, so let's go back to nature versus nurture. We've got these two approaches. Likely the solution is going to be some kind of combination between these. Okay, so this is why, this is why we want to build a robot baby or an AI baby. Okay, let's look at real human babies. Look, you old white guys <laughs> doing artificial intelligence uh, without ever actually having spent much time with a baby. <laughs> As more and more women actually come into the field, we're um, you know, bringing in insights from uh, human beings, from human psychology and especially developmental psychology. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, making observations that can shed light on how to build a machine that learns, that learns really well, and that learns the way I, uh, a human does, and it ends up a lot more like a human and able to do the kinds of things and the kinds of variety of things that humans can do. Okay, so here are some places where both types of AI fail. And there are many more, but I'll just list a few. One is they don't interact with the world, right? They're, they're pretty disembodied, right? So they're not connected up with the world. Okay, so let's give them bodies, right? So this is kind of what robotics tries to do, right? People go and like, okay, well, let's build robots. These things are going to actually interact with the world and they're going to get feedback from, uh, from their perceptual senses uh about how their actions influence the world and you know maybe we can build in some goals and have them uh learn from uh uh those observations about you know what what happens when they do various actions okay so here are a bunch of robots cool looking robots pretty exciting some of these autonomous cars we've got ibo the robot dog from sony yeah the soccer players you have pepper which uh, is kind of like a it's just like an, uh, uh, like a, an assistant that, that hangs out at malls in Japan <laughs> to help you find your way. Uh, we have here a, uh, a security robot. Uh, they used to have these at the Stanford shopping mall, but uh, they started running over children because their camera was too high to see children. Uh, they're there to, to detect, you know, if someone is, you know, trying to steal something, kind of certain behaviors suggest that someone's like grabbed something and running. But uh, yeah, it wasn't really built to consider that uh, there might be children. Uh, some of you maybe have a robot vacuum in your house. Uh, we have one. We have a pretty updated one and eh, we haven't been using it. <laughs> uh, gets stuck a lot, right? Uh, there's a lot missing still, right? Even if you, um, even if you put a body on these things. Okay. So the so let's say let's suppose they do interact with the world. Well, still they tend to be pretty narrow. I mean, very narrow. They usually are just designed to do one very specific task. Okay, human beings, right? Babies, we can transfer. Babies transfer very quickly knowledge from one domain into another. So once they learn about containers, they know about containers and they can transfer that to all these different kinds of containers. So if they just learn about bowls, they're not just stuck with bowls, right? They can, they can, um, they can understand that, okay, if you have something that looks like this, uh, you can do similar things with it, right? Uh, and, you know, that's really important because the whole point of learning about containers is that you can solve problems in various domains and babies are really good and young children are very good. At, at doing that. Okay, um, here's an example of an AI camera that was built to, to track a ball. So the camera actually is supposed to detect the soccer ball on the field and just follow it, right? So that viewers watching from home, right? Cause it was COVID-19, this was in 2020. Uh, so that viewers could, you know, watch the game and we didn't we wouldn't need even a, a a human camera person to kind of be there and track the ball well this ai mistook 
the referee's bald head for the ball. Okay, a baby would never do that, right? Even a pretty dang young baby, like a, a one-year-old, not going to mistake someone's bald head for a ball. Okay. They don't understand anything. Right. So these machines, they just make associations between images. They don't know what those images are about. They don't know that those images are caused by things in the world, that they have anything to do with the world. It's just a bunch of pixels to them and associations maybe between various sets of pixels with each other or associations between pixels and actions. Um, but it doesn't even know that its actions are actions on the world, right? Uh, even in the case of the robots. Um, when it's you know, a language processor, it's just a system of symbols, right? There's no, these, these are just shapes, right? From the inside of the robot, these are just shapes relating to more shapes. There's no, there's no grounding, there's no connection with the world, right? Babies know that words are about things, that they refer to things. So when they're learning a word, they, they don't just connect it with other words. They don't define the word bear, for example, with uh, its relationship to other words. Uh, it can, they connect it with bears somehow. <laughs> um, okay, so they don't understand anything and they lack common sense. So this is really one of the key areas that people in AI are just now starting to try to understand. Um, it used to be that if you want to work on AI and you were interested in common sense, you were kind of outcast from the field. That's just some kind of flaky notion. Uh, but people are starting to maybe be able to understand this. So what is common sense? I'd love to hear from you actually about this, because I think this is a place to drill down. What is common sense and how would we build a machine that has it? So here to think about common sense, right? We, let's think about autonomous cars. Autonomous cars don't have common sense. They're out there, they're learning from these inputs of the, what they get from the camera and um, actions that the, it takes and um, tries to achieve some set of goals, right? Now, okay, why don't we make, why do we make kids wait to be 16 to drive? <laughs> so let's think about this. Why do we have to wait? There are a couple of answers to that in chat yeah, right let's, now. Let's actually, um, let's think about common sense. I think that we should maybe um, go into the discussion now. I do have some more slides, but uh, let me stop sharing for a sec here. And let's all go into gallery mode if we can. And I would love to see your faces if you're willing, other, uh, or at the very least, I'd love to hear your voices. Um, maybe we can actually um, raise hands and um, and contribute orally if if uh, if we're comfortable. Otherwise, we can try using the chat as well. Okay. Okay, because they might get hurt. Maybe that's one reason. Okay. Well, why might they get hurt? Right. I mean, we try to build these autonomous cars that you know, supposedly are going to only have a few years of training. So, okay, maybe we don't let babies drive cars, but we'll let three-year-olds drive cars, right? Uh, maybe after three years, do you think these cars uh, can drive? Do you think these machines should be able to drive? Why might, why might they make mistakes, right? Oh, okay, maybe it needs a, a basic set of rules like an iRobot. Yeah, some kind of basic principles, right? These are the most important things to stick to. Yeah. Um, there are some fundamentals that we might want in an AI, right, or in a robot that uh, we, we want to make sure is safe for humans. Up. Ah, yes. Okay, go ahead. Who has their hand up? Hi, Quinn. Oh, I don't hear you. I don't hear you. Are we trying to unmute yourself? It looks like... Looks like Quinn is unmuted, but I don't see, I don't hear. Huh, hmm, okay. Go ahead and put it in the chat, please. 
I see Shyla says common sense is based on context that we have as humans on this earth. So I think that an AI baby would need time to develop context and get to know stuff before it can make sense. Great. Yeah, it needs time. It needs to be able to experience the world, right? Oh, maybe, maybe Quinn, because you're wearing a, he a headset, maybe that's why we can't hear you. Any others, any others want to kind of jump in here? What, why, why don't we let, why do we wait till kids are 16? And we also ask them to, to practice for a year, at least in this country, we, 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 uh, we, we need them to practice. Is there, are, are there certain things that, um, that they get from that practice maybe when they're learning that's really crucial? Is there something, something to that? They get to know the rules, yeah? You know, they usually, uh, well, they do. You're supposed to have a, a licensed driver with you. I think over 18 when you're learning to drive, when you're 15 and have a learner's permit. So why is that? Why do you need to have someone with a license next to you? I mean, it's not like they can really grab the wheel the way we do with autonomous cars and have that sort of backup co-pilot that's the human that understands the world, right? But we still want to have a, a, a licensed driver next to uh a uh, driver in training. Okay, so they can help you, right? And so they can watch you. Yeah, yeah. They can give you feedback, right? Maybe give you tips. Yeah, so this seems to be actually one of the really crucial things for the way that humans learn. Um, we get a lot of training from other people. Uh, so when we're learning words as babies or when we're learning about the physical world as babies, we usually have a grown-up caretaker with us, making sure we don't get hurt, and also demonstrating to us how things work. So we're playing with blocks as, as a little baby, as a six-month-old, but usually there's a caretaker there with us, hopefully, maybe showing us, okay, here's what happens when you do this. Hey, look, hey, look, I can knock it down, look. And maybe some of that demonstration is really helpful. Uh, another thing that babies have is, um, what's called joint attention. Um, babies understand through eye contact and various other contextual cues, they understand the intentions of the people around them. And um, they understand that, um, they understand also what the people around them are attending to. So I'll actually show you another, um, a slide about this real quick, and then we'll come back to talking. Um, okay, so here's something that uh, an autonomous car might do, right? So, so it's detecting all these objects in the road. Great. So if it's got categories, it's got representations for all of these, then it should be able to drive pretty safely and figure out, okay, when, it's, when is it safe to, to go, right? But what if there's a little toddler in a, it's Halloween and there's a to toddler wearing a kind of pylon, Little a little traffic cone costume, right? So is the car going to assume that this thing won't move? And then now the toddler is crossing the street in a very reasonable way, maybe. Um, uh, well, that would be really dangerous, right? Um, we also, you know, you notice we think it's really creepy when babies talk in movies, right? They seem to understand, you know, these sophisticated little babies that I have so much wisdom. It's it's really weird, right? Why why is that so weird? It's another kind of way to think about this. Um, okay, so a couple more insights from uh, about babies from developmental psychology. So, um, the philosopher and developmental psychologist um, from UC Berkeley, Alison Gopnik, does a lot of work on how children learn through play, and it looks like they're actually doing very sophisticated hypothesis formation testing and revision um, in ways that the best scientists and philosophers do. So very young babies are doing sophisticated probability um, and modeling the world in ways, uh, uh, representing causal relationships um, in the ways that, you know, scientists strive to do. Uh, their, their brains are kind of just built to do that, to try to understand the world. And they do that when they're, when they're just playing, right? That's, that's, how they that's, how they, that's how they do experiments. Okay, again, joint attention. So this is what I wanted to show you here. If you look, um, if you look at this 
part of the slide. So Chen Yu is um, a, a researcher at UT Austin who studies joint attention and he looks at the way that um, uh, eye contact and following eye gaze between the parent and the child or the caretaker and the child um, are involved when uh, during word learning and just during play in general. So um, he has uh, constructed these kinds of uh, experiments where he puts an eye tracker on the parent, he puts an eye tracker on the baby, and he has the parent and child interact and play. And he can then analyze, you know, when are the, the parent and the child looking at the same thing and what's going on linguistically when they're looking at the same thing. And uh, he's made some really interesting uh, observations about the role of joint attention, attending to the same thing together uh, in, in language learning. Okay, oh, there's the bigger picture. Okay, and then here's another thing to consider, and maybe this connects also with common sense, we have needs and desires, right? Maybe a robot baby and then maybe in order to build a truly intelligent or, uh, you know, maybe not even intelligent, a dumb but mental uh, uh, AI, uh, artificial uh, uh, thinker, um, maybe it needs to have its own needs and desires, or maybe at least maybe not its own needs and desires, but have needs and desires and be able to weigh them against each other. So here's a child who uh, is really hungry, wants to eat her cereal, but she spilled it. She doesn't want to get in trouble. What should she do? She has to figure out, okay, how, how do I <laughs> prioritize uh, my hunger versus, you know, my avoidance of punishment from, uh, from my parents, All right? Well, maybe they won't get too mad. Maybe I'll eat the ones on the table, right? They'll come up with uh, pretty clever solutions. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I do have some more to say about um, Bayesian networks, which are kind of causal representations of the world. Um, I'm going to skip that for now, but it's a really promising approach. I just wanna get to some of these questions. So let's, let's go to this question. Um, what would it take for a robot to understand the word cat, right? So this is maybe a way of encapsulating a lot of these issues, right? If we want a robot that understands this word, what kinds of, so here are a few, few questions to ask in exploring this. What does it need to have built in? What kind of learning algorithms does it need to have? And then what kinds of environments, what kinds of inputs does it need? Right, so if we look at babies, they've got all kinds of stuff that they may or may not need in order to say, learn to understand the word cat, right? They've got all this love. Is love something that's required? Is love in the environment? Does, does a caretaker that's really kind of attentive and helpful? Is that something that's required? Um, is joint, is interaction, some kind of linguistic interaction at least, required um, in the environment? I think this is actually a really good place to focus. So, so let's, let's explore this in our discussion. What kinds of environments does a robot baby need to have in order to come to understand the word cat? So I'll put the question in here. What environment does a robot baby need in order to understand the word cat? Okay, so there you go. You have it here in the chat so that we can all kind of work together. I've got you in gallery mode. I don't actually see you, but I hope that you will indicate that you would like to speak um, and hopefully you can unmute yourself and we can have a conversation about this. Declan says, be in a room full of cats for a month. Ah, good, <laughs> yes. So, you, so, so in order to understand the word cat, you need to actually be in the physical presence of cats, right? Maybe that's a very fundamental requirement. 
right? Like maybe you'll never really understand the word cat unless you're in the physical presence. Now, I wonder though, are there things, are there words that we learn as, as very young people without actually physical interaction, without physical presence? So see if you can come up with counter examples to any of these suggestions, right? Do we need to have direct kind of proximate interaction with, with the thing that the word refers to? Quinn suggests that we need to first understand language as a way of communication and then use that understanding to teach the word cat. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, what is language? as communication, right? And so this is, you know, linguistics and, and um, psycholinguistics, which is sort of the psychology about linguistics and language learning and language processing. These are fields that are really, really important to being able to understand these questions, right? Yeah, so those, I mean, that especially um, is gonna be important for um, what, what's built in, right? Humans are able to learn language, right? Uh, other animals, they're able to learn to communicate in some ways. Uh, we don't usually call it language because it's not compositional and productive in the way that human languages are. Um, but maybe we could even uh, look at kind of more simple creatures that uh, communicate and maybe, maybe that's even more central to common sense in some way. Of course, you know, those creatures may not understand the word cat. Uh, uh, Shaila suggests that we show the cat to this robot baby from all angles. Mm. Show and also say cat at the same time as Anya suggests, so yeah. they can correlate the word with yeah. all types of. Yes, yeah, so we want all the angles, right? Because cats, you know, they're these three-dimensional things. They're not just a two-dimensional, you know, cat face, uh, right? Well, what babies do, you know, we don't even have to show them all the dimensions of the cat. We let them kind of crawl around and they get to explore. And then they even, you know, will touch it and see, you know, what happens to it when, it, when they push it. And, you know, they can, they can uh, discover all kinds of things when they're playing with cats, right? So maybe they need to play with cats, or at least maybe that would be really helpful. Uh, Declan suggests that we need a video clip of a cat saying cat, so we <laughs> add some movement there as well, right? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So not just the picture, but the yeah, yeah. So seeing the movement, right? Actually, I don't know, Declan, is this is this kind of being a yoga clip of a cat saying cat, <laughs> or or a human saying the word cat uh, uh, while showing the clip? Oh, with words coming out of the cat's mouth. Yeah, well, that would be great. Well, you know, I mean, maybe in order to really understand the word cat, we at least need to hear them meow. Uh, or at least be able to learn that they can make certain certain noises. On the other hand, maybe a person who who's hard of hearing or, or completely deaf could still understand the word cat, presumably, right? So we can think about what kinds of sensory experiences do you need to have in order to understand the word cat? Do you have to be able to see? Do you have to be able to touch? Do you have to have at least some sensory interactions with cats in order to understand the word? And then, yeah, what, what associations then do you need to have with those perceptual experiences and hearing the word cat, right? Uh, Mas says, I spoke to a cat once, so maybe you can actually interact oh. with a cat, play yeah. with a cat, speak to yeah. a cat. <laughs> All right, some of you are having to leave. Goodbye. It was really great having your ideas out here. Please, uh, please keep thinking about this and reach out to me. I'm, uh, I'm in Paradox Lab. You can find me at paradoxlab.org if you want to reach out, or, or through Julia, you can please, uh, you, you can uh, send more questions. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Chen Yu, who I mentioned about um, uh, doing studies on joint attention, one of the things that he and his group have found is that um, if, the, uh, if the adult is holding an object and says the word, the child doesn't learn the word very well. But if the child is holding the object and the adult says the word, and especially if the child looks at the adult and sees that the adult is also looking at that object, so the thing that the, the baby is really focused on already, uh, that's what they're going to connect the word with. Yeah. But what's cool is, you know, they don't need, babies don't need thousands and thousands of examples of associating cats with the word cat. You know, they usually learn it very quickly, right? Uh, 
they probably get a lot of examples of cat if they're learning cat, but maybe once they've learned about a few animals, um, they can go to the zoo and just see, you know, one giraffe and uh, they, they can learn the word giraffe, uh, uh, you know, when they're very, very young, just starting to talk. Other, other insights, other things, what do you think about um, having affection? Do you think having affection and love the way that babies have, do you think that that could be a requirement for raising an AI baby, uh, a, an AI that actually um, learns the way that humans learn? What do we get? What, what do babies get from that? Is there something valuable there in their learning? Declan says yes. Can you say more? I would like to hear, you know, this is this is an idea I've recently kind of started thinking about and I'd love to to hear from you if uh, if you think this is interesting, you know, if you think this is promising. Right? What 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 can we get from that? What what do you think the baby is getting from kind of having having care? Oh, to get it to listen to you and think of you as a guide. Yeah, so it's maybe some kind of trust. Right. So so if it knows you love it, you care about it, you're trying maybe to to bring it into your social community so that it can uh, be part of the group. Right. Uh, humans are pretty hardwired to want to have a, a sense of belonging. Right. Um, partly because, you know, babies can't survive on their own. <laughs> so we need that. Right. But then maybe maybe that's a requirement um, for for learning as well as just, you know, for survival. When you talk about affection, do you think, uh, do you talk about parent to child or child to parent or mutual? Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think that it can be one directional? So, you know, um, you kind of have a case of the one directional kind of communication when you put a child in front of a TV, right? They're, they're observing, they're being exposed to language. Do you think that's enough? Or do you think there needs to be some interaction? Do you think that there needs to be some kind of, you know, back and forth, some feedback, some tighter interaction, some loops in there? Um, psychologists have found that children who uh, mostly are exposed to language through a screen, <laughs> Uh, learn far fewer words than children who have, you know, a very attentive caretaker uh, interacting with them. Um, yeah, there needs to be some interaction, Quinn says, yeah. Um, so they understand what they, the baby, and also have some say in what happens. Uh -huh. Yeah, so maybe um, kind of treating language as being part of an activity, part of what we're doing. We're using language maybe to accomplish some goal, to build a tower together, right? And uh, maybe that's really important. So, so having language um, be, be in that context of uh, cooperating in some way. And maybe also having kind of a shared interest, right? In the project. And, you know, humans do this all the time. You know, most of the time, I think when we communicate with each other, we're not just trying to transfer information to one another. It seems like we're really trying to connect. And I noticed this with my baby that she, you know, a lot of the time, all she's trying to do is connect. Um, and so she'll just, she'll, she'll kind of uh, tell me about what she's looking at. She'll say, hey, isn't this cool? Like, I feel this, or I love you, you know, and just telling me what's on her mind. Um, uh, and I feel like a lot of people, you know, when we interact, you know, we, we come up with games to play, we come up with projects to do together. Um, but most of what we're doing, uh, even if, you know, the ultimate goal is to accomplish some task, build a house or whatever, um, a lot of that requires some interaction and bonding and connection and kind of figuring out what each other's goals and intentions are, what each other's beliefs are, and kind of coordinating that there's kind of a dance that happens right so that's why you know maybe work colleagues try to uh go out and have some casual you know have parties and interact with each other and kind of just get to know each other so that um, they can get aligned right um and maybe that's in more the more core goal right um of course we want to work together to solve problems but uh you know just connecting might be kind of uh one of the the core motivations for for using language. Quinn says the yeah. baby needs to understand that the environment can affect the baby and the baby can actually affect the environment back. Yeah, yeah, so being able to understand that, right? Uh, yeah, and, and um, 
uh, I won't have time really to share it now, but I, I have a, a series of, of clips of my baby when she was just under three months old, learning um, uh, how, how her body movements uh, affect the world. So she was, she was uh, in a play gym, she had some toys that she could hit. And at first you can see she's just kind of throwing out all of her hands and feet at once and noticing sometimes there would be a jiggle or a movement and a sound and uh, over, over just a matter of days, you could see her, you know, within two weeks really get the association between, you know, this particular hand movement in the direction of what I'm looking at makes a sound um, and being able to, you know, really choose how she's affecting the world. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of really, really tight interaction there, right? Being able to see the effects of your actions and then figure out um, how to kind of isolate those. You know, and then, you know, if the object is on a, in a different position, she learns, she, she, she immediately knew that, you know, it's not gonna work to move that same hand that she, she learned with um, to make it make a sound and jiggle. She, she knows, okay, now I need to move this other hand. So she's able to kind of isolate those, um, those associations. She's able to kind of uh, generalize and abstract away from the particular um, you know, motor you know, action um, and the effect, right? She's able to say, okay, well, if I use one of my hands, um, and reach for something that I'm looking at. Uh, I'll get that that beautiful bell jingly sound that I'm uh, that I enjoy. All right, some of you need to leave, and we have gone way over time, so please feel free to leave. Building the communication together, yeah. So Julia, yeah. So this is um this is kind of an idea from um um. Uh, yes, Herb Clark, is it Herb Clark, who, um, who talks about um, the idea of actually constructing language together um, and agreeing on what words we're going to use to refer to various things, right? So um, I think he calls it um, collaborative reference. So if you're in an environment where uh, there are objects that you just don't have words for yet, uh, often you'll observe humans kind of coming up with new words for things and kind of starting to use them together and agreeing that this is how they're going to use the words. So words aren't just these sort of symbols that are just sort of sitting out there in space um, uh, and, you know, connected to other symbols. They're very much, um, there's a lot behind them. There's a lot of intention behind them. They, they, they connect with the world and they also connect with what we're trying to do with the world and what we're trying to, to share and convey about the world. All right. Thanks guys. All right, so uh, if uh, Quinn and Declan, do you have some more um, ideas? I'd love to hear your voices if you want to, if you want to unmute yourselves if you're able. Otherwise, um, you know, if you have any more questions, do you want to um, put them in the chat? And there's plenty more to explore here. Um, we've got a lot to learn about babies. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's possible to build an AI baby that will come to understand the word cat? Do you think it's possible? I would like to, I'd like to know, do you think a machine could understand the word cat? Some people think that machines are just, you know, they're not the kind of material, right, that can, that can have that kind of software, right? You got to be made of meat, maybe, right? Is there something special about being made of meat? Or is there something at least special about I don't know, having biological needs. Yeah, Quinn, you have your hand up. So go ahead, please try to try unmuting and see if that works. Can you hear me this time? Oh, yes, yes. Thank okay, you. I think it was my mic because it, it, it doesn't, my headset doesn't have a microphone. Um, so a cat isn't necessarily associated by the word cat because you could also associate it by the word cat in another language right right yeah. so you need to teach it somehow to associate cat as um the word cat is an extension all the words that mean cat are just a way of explaining a cat but they aren't a cat itself and the actual cat isn't is an animal, something that can affect its environment with meaning. And um, it's a mammal. Um, it 
things like that that define a cat that aren't based on language. Yeah, so it sounds like what you're getting at is um, where where I went actually in my dissertation for my for my doctoral thesis was, you know, okay, how would you get a machine that actually has meaningful linguistic representations like words that mean things? Well, you got to start with concepts, right? It's got to have mental symbols that mean those things, and then those concepts of something like a mental word for cat, right? So even if you've never heard the word cat, you could maybe think about cats, right? And you can actually mean cat and you have the concept cat that you can apply to individual cats when you see them. Um, but um, that, so that sort of having that kind of a, a symbol maybe um, and then associating that mental term with the linguistic term. Of course, it's a mental representation of the linguistic term, right? So, so you, you maybe, um, you know, one way to think about concepts is that we have this file and we store information about um, things in that file. So there's a cat file, right? So, so you have this concept cat and then there are things you believe about cats, right? So what has to go into that file? Uh, one thing that could go into that file is um, cats are called cats. <laughs> right, so that's one in, one bit of information that we have about cats, right? And maybe um, you know, there's other candidates that could go into that. So um, cats are mammals, or uh, cats are furry, cats meow, right? So which of those beliefs do you think is required for having the concept cat? So now we've moved from understanding the word cat to having the concept cat, because that seems to be sort of a precursor, right? So what, what needs to be in that file in order to have the concept cat? Yeah, Quinn, go ahead. Maybe you need to kind of, to teach an AI what a cat is, find as hard as it is, a way to teach it that without using any words, mm -hmm. just completely create an AI that, that does not use any form of verbal communication so it can understand a cat by the fact that this is what it looks like mm -hmm. things that are similar to this are also cats yeah and things that are similar to this but are a little bit too far apart mm -hmm. are different yeah, yeah. shape yeah, appearance is... not just a word yeah this is exactly the where i went in my thinking um you know so there's these um these unsupervised learning algorithms which form clusters in the things that they observe. So maybe, and this is this is what I actually ended up trying to build when um, when I was working uh, on building an AI, an AI baby. Um, I put it into, it was a virtual world, but it had different kinds of fruits. And it would go around and observe all the objects and form clusters. So there were these round red objects and there were these um, cylindrical yellow objects and there were these, uh, blue round objects, right? Uh, these these uh, pyramid shaped red objects. So it would kind of notice that as it's observing the world, it would kind of cluster into these different um, groups on their perceptual features. Um, and then, so no language was involved, but by noticing that there are these, these clusters, it could kind of use that cluster as a concept. Now, um, some people might learn the word cat, or sorry, maybe uh, would learn the concept cat through those something like visual visual cues, visual sensors. Maybe they're using also other sensors like touch and hearing, right? Uh, maybe taste or at least texture on the tongue, who knows? Smell maybe, right? So we know that the animals, you know, that, that there's sort of clusters of different kinds of uh, animals in our environment. Uh, and maybe maybe uh, doing something like that is involved in the in uh, coming to to understand the word cat. But do you think that you know um, you know a three year old? Do you think they understand the word cat? Um, usually they don't understand the word mammal, and they don't know that cats are mammals. Uh, they don't even have a concept of mammal, right? But uh, presumably they they have the concept cat, right? And also, again, someone who maybe is blind. Um, could come to have the concept cat, but through some other set of sensors. So maybe the file doesn't have to have any particular set of beliefs, but it has to have something, right? But then what makes that file mean cat, 
right? And how can we get a machine to have this symbol, these or this set of symbols? Uh, how can we get it to relate those in the right way to the world so that it actually means cat? And this is this really kind of gets really into the philosophical puzzles about reference and what's you know what is that relationship? Uh, and can a machine have that? And, and I guess it's almost like a, a, a cat to someone who is blind is different than a cat to someone who is not. Um, maybe someone who, who, because language is a combination of visual and um, it's a combination of, of the senses. Yeah. Mm. But the way you recognize one thing is generally if I see a cat, I don't hear, smell, taste, or feel it. I can still recognize it as a cat um, or I could still feel it. And I might be able to eventually figure out that it's a cat or I can hear it and I can definitely figure out that it's a cat. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a combination of senses that, that defines language explaining a cat. So you could, create an AI that only has one sense, make it define a cat, combine that with an AI that has another sense different from that one and make it figure out what a cat is and keep doing that until you build something that has all of the senses we know of mm -hmm. is an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, if someone is only learning um, the category cat through vision, right? Maybe they've never actually been able to touch one or, or hear one or smell one. Um, do you think that's enough though for them to, uh, when they see another one of those, to, to think, oh, that's a cat, right? In order to think that's a cat, right? It has to be able to think of it as a cat, right? It has to have a representation let's call it cat <laughs> in mental code, right? That, that means cat, whatever cat is, right? This abstract property, right? This property that all these cats share, right? So when we're thinking, oh, that's, that's one of those, right? Uh, some argue that um, you don't need any perceptual information at all in that file in order to have the concept. So, um, uh, the philosopher Hilary Putnam actually had this uh, great example of uh, an ordinary person who um, can't distinguish perceptually elm trees from beech trees, but can understand the sentence, you know, beech trees are shady, right? Uh, and uh, so they don't maybe even have any kind of perceptual associations with the word, but they maybe trust that there are people who do and kind of borrow the meaning from them. But my file maybe for, for beech tree, as a matter of fact, you know, I don't, I don't have any idea what beech trees look like. Um, I don't know if they're short or tall or leafy or branchy or, um, you know, what color they are. Um, but um, what I store is there's a kind of tree, it's called beech and somebody knows what it is. And that's all I have. But I'm able to think about beech trees, which is kind of cool, right? And, and as part of a linguistic community and a part of a community of people, uh, we can kind of um, be able to share information even without having ourselves perceptually encountered with, with the thing. This is so amazing. Thank you so much, Iris. Unfortunately, you know, everyone has to go now, but yes. th this was uh, a delightful webinar. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. This was a really great opportunity. And I think, um, you know, Quinn, you're, you're really, um, I, I see myself in your, in your thinking here. I think you're going down very similar avenues. And uh, I mean, uh, not that that's necessarily the, the best way to go. Uh, we want to have different avenues, but um, your, your sophisticated, uh, your, your thinking seems to be uh, pretty sophisticated. This is, uh, this is what I got a PhD for is having these kinds of thoughts that you're throwing out here. So this is, this is really cool. So yeah, I, I hope you'll continue to think about you know, what would you build? What would you build into a machine so that it would come to understand the word cat? Um, I'd love to see what you come up with, even if it's not an actual program, you know, just a, a blueprint for a program, right? Just a kind of description of an architecture of what it would mean.
And I'm sure we will have more questions for you after this webinar. Awesome. I will send them I'll your way. Back. So we will keep in touch. Yeah, hopefully we can all keep working on these problems together. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Quinn. Thanks, Julia. Thank you so yeah, thank much. Thank you. That was very good. Cool. Thanks, Quinn. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.